Hello and welcome to my stream. We will do some package source today, as we have been. Uh, the session may be a little on the shorter side. Depends when my next meeting becomes available. Uh, but that's that. We'll get set up with my chat view over here. All right, uh, so in our last session, as you may recall, we were looking at uh, updating one of the packages in my repology output that was outdated. And it was Python approval tests over here. Uh, and what we came out of from that session was not a successful update, but not the worst thing. Uh, we came up with a plan for how I could incrementally make progress on that, which is what's needed. Um, that makes me think the next thing I want to double back to, because that was enough for me for now with approval utilities. I'm going to have to come back to that when I'm less frustrated by it. But that's why I wanted to write down what I learned. Uh, what I want to come back to now is another piece of work that I have in progress, which is not listed here because it's very new that it has a different upstream. So if you look in Repology for the project called Bink IMAP, did it do my search? It, I see, without this maintainer, maybe. Might be searching the wrong way. Let's try again. Project. Think IMAP. There we go. There are a few places where it's packaged and none of them has this new version. There is this, uh, there was this unclarity about uh, what the newest version was as of the way that it was left um, quite some years ago. Uh, FreeBSD ports and I both interpreted uh, 1.2.13 as the last released version. But there was a pre-release version of this, and it looks like whatever package manager this is decided to go for that one. Now, this is going to become moot, I think, because a new maintainer has taken up the task. And there's a new version. It's a version 2. And I think it's uh, worthy of the numbering. So the same fellow who we know from SQMail, which is a different fork of QMail that he develops himself, um, unfortunately not in a public Git repository, but it's a long-standing fork, very well-known, very featureful. Uh, I've definitely borrowed code from there and then changed it to suit my taste. Um, he also maintains Uxpy SSL which was uh, the first implementation. He inherited it and took over maintainership uh, of uh, an extension to Uxpy, which you might know from TCP server and TCP client, that supports um, delayed encryption, opportunistic encryption, turning on encryption over a channel that began unencrypted when the application has negotiated to do that. Uh, so that's an extension to the Uxpy protocol. And Oops by SSL was the first place where that was implemented. Uh, I'm still using it, although I actually want to move on to something else. Um, but so that's this is the same fellow, Dr. Erwin Hoffman, we would say in English, and Avin Hoffmann, we would say in German, uh, who took it upon himself to revive Bink IMAP, which is a, an IMAP server written back in the day that wanted to use check password, much the same way that QML pop 3 d itself did. And quick aside, the way that I adapted um, the submission service to also do. So a picture of QML pop 3 d in the old upstream QML way is this, which was a very nice design. It had one major mistake that I discovered, as far as I know, 
which is that you can authenticate as root, even though it doesn't make sense. And it seems like that should not have been anybody's intention to allow. It doesn't make sense because according to QMail's local delivery agent, local mail will never be delivered to the root user. And that's because local, the local delivery agent will never be run as the root user. You have to, when you set up a new QMail instance, designate a forwarding address for root mail for precisely that reason. So it's surprising for a number of reasons, including the fact that there's never going to be a mailer for the root user, and the fact that it seems like the kind of thing that should have been prevented in the first place, to use a network service as a way to dictionary attack a root password. So I wrote a very small program that you can integrate into, I suppose, any any DJB style command chain. And all it does is make sure that the user it's running as is not root. The, the UID is not zero. And that prevents that attack. Uh, there are a couple of slight improvements to the QMail pop-up code when I adapted it into AuthUp, which also supports SMTP. More on that in a second. Uh, but mainly that's it. Mainly it's that we fix that root hole, you could call it, so that even if somebody manages to type the root password and get it correct, it just looks like a failed login. It returns the same error code the check password would return if the authentication were incorrect. And so it stops being possible to use this network service to hit the root password. Um, and then we also replace plain text TCP server with optional encryption, depends on uh, administrative uh, configuration, whether encryption is gonna be required before authentication or not. Uh, and that's a function of OOXPY TLS. Uh, but that's all supported by AuthUp, and this is the POP service done in a more modern encrypted way. And then analogous to that, this is the case I was trying to explain with uh, Check Password. It used to be the case before, you know, in the old QMail world, that there wasn't authentication in the SMTP service on port 25, and the submission service on port 587 hadn't been standardized yet. So people were trying to use port 25 for both things, both as the server that other servers would give mail to for you, for your own server, uh, and the submission service, which later became a distinct thing on a distinct port later, uh, where you authenticate in some way or are otherwise allowed to relay, uh, which means to send mail not from this server to not this server. And the way we do that now is it's a separate service, you authenticate to it, and then that's what it's for. Um, but back in the day, people would apply a patch if they wanted this to QML SMTPD to let you authenticate to that. And it was super weird, super weird. It looked like this. Um, you had a TCP server on port 25. You had QML SMTPD running as its child, as a particular QML user, QML D. Kind of makes sense. Uh, without the authentication piece patched into it. What the authentication piece patched into it would do is teach QMail SMTPD to run check password as its child process, which, as you'll note, looks very different from what was happening in the POP scenario, which is as this was the design intention. And this is just a different use of the same tool. It's very strange. It always struck me as very strange, and I always tried to avoid that patch whenever I could and do things a different way. Uh, and the way this would succeed or fail is the check password would run a command that always returns zero, and if the check password itself succeeded, then it would return a success code to SMTPD, where the patch would say, ah, success code, then let's continue. And the state was managed inside that process uh, and did not change user or context at all other than to allow relay. Uh, and I just, I always found this very strange. I'm glad it was done. It helped a lot of people, but it always felt wrong to me. And so when I had a chance to apply my understanding and to extend it, I came up with something that seemed more analogous to what POP had been doing and what, what had been intended for check password. And that's pictured in these two pictures where I split the port 25 service into two because we now know that there's a standard thing called a submission service on 587. Both of them go from TCP server to SSL server. Neither of them is encrypted by default. Uh, port 25 in particular, you can't do that unless you only have very specific servers that you're ever going to communicate with. But a general purpose mail server can't do that because a lot of mail will come in unencrypted. 
Uh, but you can make it possible to upgrade server to server. And that's what fix SMTPIO does in this use case. It merely sits in between the listener on port 25 and the child process uh, that is the SMTP listener and interposes itself to change the capabilities offered when clients ask or other servers ask, uh, one of which can be TLS using Uxpy TLS. And then fix SMTPIO uh, runs as a proxy, not like a store and forward proxy, which might be what you're thinking in the SMTP context, uh, but like a line for line protocol proxy. And in most cases, it passes what it receives and what it from the client to the server, what it receives from the server back to the client. But depending on configuration, it can change some of those responses, replace them, add to them, uh, remove them, various things like that. Um, and one of the things it can do, because it speaks Uxpy TLS, is provide an encrypted channel to this child process, which doesn't have to learn anything. It can work with an unpatched SMTPD to provide a TLS encryption for it. Uh, another thing it can do, there was a security vulnerability a couple of years ago in Start TLS, which is exactly this implementation of uh, opportunistic encryption for SMTP, the protocol. And many mail servers had vulnerabilities because um, if you threw a bunch more commands at the mail server, I think it was immediately after the start TLS, but before the server had a chance to respond, you could still get those commands through. I don't remember the details very well. What I remember was thinking, huh, I wonder if I have this problem. I hope I don't because of the way I designed this. And it was true. And actually I could be even more thorough to make sure I don't have the problem, uh, which is that when someone, when another server negotiates TLS, we can actually kill our child process and start a new one because this is in charge. And so we can make very sure that the state is cleared when start TLS has been negotiated, kill the process and put a new one in. You can be very sure the state has been cleared. Uh, I don't have to be smart to be right about that. And that's why I was able to not be vulnerable to that vulnerability. Um, so this is, again, this is the port 25 case for opportunistic encryption. The other part of this old picture was authentication. And for that, we have a submission service on 587. Again, this, this one you could choose if you wanted to, uh, to just be encrypted from the get-go. Uh, I decided I would set it up as unencrypted and also require start TLS in the same way. Uh, and by policy for this one, by policy for this one, uh, it's available but not required on my server and should be on most. And by policy for me, this one, it is available and you cannot authenticate until you've done it. I don't want people sending clear text passwords around. Um, I could probably just as easily make it encrypted to begin with, but it pleased me to exercise my code in this way. Uh, so uh, this picture more obviously resembles the pop picture. And that means that its use of check password more obviously fits the design for check password. Check password's job is to run a child process or refuse to, depending on authentication. That's not anybody else's job and to change the context of the process that it calls, if need be, uh, such as changing who it runs as. That's another thing that happens in this scenario. Because you could log in as root, you could wind up running a QMail pop 3 d service process as the root user, because it runs as whoever logged in. And once you introduce check not root, you can't. That can never happen. It can only run as the authenticated user who can never be root. And that's why this is green green is better likewise in the submission service case um, what we have here is uh, both auth up which is a combination of the pop authentication code and the smtp authentication code borrowed from here but adapted to run in the context i think that would be the right design check password as a child check not root as a child of that and then if we manage to authenticate which in this case means also to encrypt first, and we're not doing it as root, then we run a fix SMTPIO whose configuration does something a little different in this case. 
it runs in front of a slightly different program that speaks a slightly different variant of SMTP um, that, again, doesn't have to be patched or not patched. It works equally well um, because there are authentication patches for this program also. Um, you can have it and it's fine. You cannot have it and it's fine. That's the point of the proxy program here. And um, it makes this program able to run as a child process instead of a thing listening directly on a network port and as a particular Unix user ID. This way it can be run as the Unix user ID of the authenticated user. Uh, and again, that more closely matches the design of QMailPop 3D and it has functional benefits, which we can go into at some point. But this is all a sidetrack to say that check password here uh, was and is a beloved design. If all of your requirements for authentication are met by this kind of design, it's very nice to work with. Um, it's just the Unix process model in authentication form. Uh, and that's what Bink IMAP has to recommend it, that even though something like DoveCop is great software, and many of us have used it for a long time, I've always wished that I could use uh, an IMAP server that was check password oriented, just to fit this diagram that describes everything else on my mail server. Uh, but it was hard to get into because it had been left to die on the vine for a long time, which is why I'm really interested now when Dr. Hoffman revived it, I want to update the package in package source. And so with the time that we have, I would like to try to make more progress on that. So what we have at the moment is very much in progress. Oof. Lots of things happening here. First of all, I have a Vim swap file. Doesn't look too good. Um, do a diff here. Yeah, so you can see I'm partway through this change from 1.2.13, which is generally agreed to be the last release quality version, and updated to 2.0.15, which is the most recent from this new maintainer. And so I'm updating where the code will get fetched from, uh, how to extract it, what the name will look like. The home page is now this one. Uh, and then we have these dependencies that I have to decide what to do with. But first, I wanted to get the package, I don't know, kind of, kind of working. And then decide what would make it work better, and if I need to do that now, or if I could do it later. Yeah, so the new maintainer also uses uh, DJB's slash package mechanism for building. Uh, and that is something I need to adapt to. One of the things that we took out in this update so far is that we uh, no longer want to link with OpenSSL directly, which sounds like a step backward, but it absolutely is the opposite. Uh, on my to-do list, if I ever was going to revive Bink IMAP, maybe as part of the NotQmail organization, um, I would have wanted to do the same thing. I would have wanted to rip out any network code from Bink IMAP and rely on Uxpy SSL, Uxpy TLS, to have the, uh, the encryption happen in a separate process space. Um, have the engine maybe even run as a different user, which the parent process can do, and it does. And just leave it not my concern. I just want to be able to negotiate start TLS or not, but not have that OpenSSL code in my program. And the new upstream author made the same choice, which I appreciate very much. And that means that we don't link with OpenSSL anymore. So there's no longer this TLS option. And there's no longer 
whether to include OpenSSL's libraries and includes in the build path or not. We just always don't link with OpenSSL, and that is more secure. Uh, looks like I have some run script updating to do. And I'm partway through it. Yeah, this part is a little fraught for me. Uh, right now I have a pretty fair amount invested in some custom shell scripts that I wrote a long time ago and have been enhancing ever since. Specifically, there's a bunch here. Uh, one example that's pretty straightforward would be Qmail send. This is, you know, the, the main, when you run Qmail start on your system and it brings the basic mail server processes up. There's a documented way to do that. Actually, there are many. Uh, most notably with Life with Qmail. And what is documented is a command much like this that you probably would put here um, that replaces the, the shell of the script with a call to env, which then empties out the environment sets the path and nothing else back into the environment and then runs qmail start with one additional argument which is by default if you don't specify do you want things going to a mailbox or do you want them going to a mail dir and that comes out of the contents of this file so you can see the influence here uh, if you if you squint and if i point at some things you can see the influence here because uh, there's a post env for after we call env. That's what this is, corresponding to this. And then we set the path much as the env invocation would, although instead of var qmail bin, we use actual package source paths. And then we have uh, other things we could set in env. That's what the qmail send post env is for. And so there's an example of something that can be set there. Likewise, the idea of having a file called control default delivery, this is not part of Qmail's code itself, but it is a very convenient idea because all you have to do is read the first line or cat it and put it into a string, which is the easiest thing to do in a shell. And then it becomes the argument to Qmail start. So I kept that idea. It is the argument to Qmail start. And by default, it is the first line of control default delivery. So I was definitely influenced by life with Qmail, but you can see these shell scripts have a lot of other things going on. And the upshot of it, I'll actually show you on my mail server, live instance. And I can say, and it's exactly the same kind of report that I would get if I wanted to know about uh, what's something else I have running. Is there a MySQL? Sure. Uh, and I've written similar scripts for DJB DNS. Oops. So I have those three pieces running. Um, so I have a lot invested in this style of shell script, is what I'm trying to say, because I have an investment in NetBSD's rc.d system for service control in general, because my servers are generally NetBSD, and because the rc.d system is portable to other systems. I use it on other as well. Um, and I'm saying this, this whole topic of updating the run scripts is a little fraught for me this whole stuff, because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking I want to move away from it, at least, at least be able to move away from it, at least have the option to move away from it. And what I would want to move away from it to 
is something more like a supervision suite. Uh, Demon Tools in the old days, Demon Tools Encore, if you're really committed to the compatibility with those. Or S6 by the author of a lot of other software that I like. Um, and I haven't decided how to go about this yet because I don't want to write my own scripts and maintain them separately from package source in parallel to, uh, but they don't exactly fit. There's an impedance mismatch because package source services have two kinds of um, startup scripts that they can provide. One is the NetBSD RC.D style. Again, because that's portable across systems, the, the underlying mechanism has been ported, or uh, Solaris-based uh, SMF, those manifest files. And some really popular services have had those created for them too. Uh, but a supervision suite generically is not something that package source is set up to integrate with. Um, and so I think the way for me to square the circle and have uh, supervision suite style shell scripts, which means run in the foreground, uh, service output, if any, goes to standard out, and errors, things for the logs typically, go to standard error. Um, and then it stays in the foreground. I could combine that much as I kind of have already. And then the problem to figure out is where the configuration settings come from. Because part of the rc.d deal is that there's an rc.conf in Etsy, and you can put variable definitions in there to override things like this and this. These are some defaults, but you could set them to anything else. And that is typically going to be at odds with a supervision suite where if there are settings that are in the shell script or maybe they're in uh, a directory of files containing environment variables an envdir and so i really have to work this through i really have to try extracting a foreground script that reads its configuration in both contexts and then have that be what the rc.d script runs and just work an example of that through and get an idea where I'm going with this. But I am going to be going that way. So in the meantime, I just need to need to hand hack this Bink IMAPD service to start the way that things have been started. It just gives me a little, a little weird feeling to know that that's not the direction I'm trying to be going. But I do want to complete this update. which might be hard to believe, given how long I've been talking. <laughs> Let's try and do a little more of the work. Um, so where are we at this point? If I just, if I just do a make. So this is written in C++, which I don't know real well and don't want to learn much about. So hopefully I don't have to to get things building. Okay. And then if we try to bundle it up, is that going to go? It did. And what does our packing list look like? Looks like he added an update cache command. Presumably something that's called from the local delivery agent, like you may local. So that by the time you hit the IMAP service, the there's an index that has already been updated. I think that's what that's for. And that hadn't been something available before. Um, it looks like we got rid of share doc for the most part. And yeah, actually, yeah, and all we have are a few handy scripts in there.
I wish we weren't using this this word Pam. I find it to be very confusing. Um, given that we're using the check password interface, I assume that's what's pluggable about the authentication is that you can pick a different check password program. It would be really nice if what it said was authentication is based on the check password interface. For system users, use DJB's check password. Or if um, you know, if you want to use a different password database, use a check password that supports that. There's nothing new here, as far as I know. It'd be nice to say it in an old way. So. Yes, and here's some notes from the previous, the original author. That's nice, he got an official green light. There's a mailing list, I don't remember whether I've subscribed to it. I don't know if my feelings should be hurt. I don't see the package source package in this list. I'll say my feelings are not hurt because it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so I can't judge at a glance here if what I have for my package is complete. I can see that um, what I'm building is matching this list. So that's something. Uh, what was I doing with T2SDE? There's a bunch. Of, yeah, okay. So this was going to be when there, before there was an upstream. But there totally is now. So I don't, I'm not going to borrow any of that funny stuff. What about to do? Woof. Yeah, we had once thought that we would be, for not QMail, that we would be wanting to modernize Bink IMAP. But Dr. Hoffman took the job. So that's no longer on this page. What else is all this about? Ways to, ways to validate. I already got the content here. Okay. All right. Bounce back out of there. My commit message. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, I had started on this uh, as 2.0.14 as soon as it appeared, and he quickly released a new point release. These lines are just a bit long as well. Keep wrapping them. If that's fine. This is too long. No tap characters. Okay, good. OK. 
Okay. Okay, so when I commit this at some point, that's a good commit method. What else have we got here? Anything to update about that? Borrowing a little text from the web page. <clears throat> That's a little better. Uh, well, did he get rid of IMAP Dur here? Doesn't say. Okay, got our license. Looks like it's pretty clear. And then how to start a service, are there examples? Wow, okay. What about starting a service? Okay, here we go. Yeah, I was mentioning earlier, uh, envder misspelled here. Environment variables override the command line arguments. So it comes with some example scripts. The dashboard says this is a piano practice stream. Very much not the case. That's confusing. Mm, can I update that text now? I'm not going to worry about it. Sure. Uh, yeah, this, sorry, this is not a piano practice stream. I forgot to update it. Now then. I guess we're at the point where I'm trying to get the startup script to go. What happens when we do? That could be a good next step. Okay, and then a good way to develop this script, I think, would be to install the package, which I believe has all the parts it's supposed to have. Uh, let this script get installed to at crc.de, the typical install location. Whack on it in place there until something works and then bring back the changes here. That's typically a good way. So, and I got Let's just rebuild and reinstall, okay. So now we have a script. Yep. 
here. Uh, if it works, then this would work. Okay, so here's one of the things about rc.conf. I gotta say, I think I map these, yeah. Okay. It's expecting to find an Etsy package bink imap.conf. Is that still a thing? Maybe not. Um, yeah, let's look into the extracted source directory and see if Example scripts, right? No, an example service. There we go. Yeah, so this is that service supervisor style script where things are going to get run in the foreground and something's going to manage that. I don't see it saying anything about a big imap.conf. So, for an hypothesis, don't need one. Let's start editing. I don't think this is a real thing. Okay, something tried to do a soft limit invocation and it didn't go. Yeah, let's just try leaving that off for now. Oh, something's happening. Uh, we got an SSL server going. It's still running. Okay, something's happening. Let's see how it compares. Got a process as root. It's called nbbink imapd to indicate that it's using my run scripts, NB, NetBSD, package source. Uh, delayed encryption, dash N. Listening on any port, on any host, uh, port 993. And then it's running bink imap up. Check password, check not root, big guy map D, mailer. This looks broadly, broadly comparable. Uh, I happen to know that this is really the SSL server under a different name, which corresponds to this. Um, and why? What is the function of this? The run. A listener on those ports confused by that 
because this is not set UID. And we are going to run a check password, and it is going to change to a user, presumably. I wonder if this doesn't work with system users as written, because it would be running as these less privileged, it would have been running as QMLD, and would not be able to set that kind of context here. So, okay. Here we are speaking to an IMAP server. Okay. So this is how to speak some IMAP. I know how to speak POP somewhat well, SMTP somewhat well. IMAP not at all, so this is handy. But I'm not going to be showing you my password today. But the point was, this is the listener. How does one quit? I guess with mConnect I can just interrupt. Okay. All right. Broadly speaking, this is doing something. Uh, what about the... This is going to be my use case. Delayed encryption, just like so, yeah. Okay, these are all pretty similar. In that case, in that case, I feel like we're doing some progress here. What did we learn so far? That uh, the .conf file is not a thing anymore. Right? Is there anything else? Right, the soft limit stuff is not working at the moment. I think that's a Mac OS X problem right now. But I'm happy to defer it and let the, let the diff review process remind me that I need to figure it out later. Right, there's some more settings that we need to set that I got from reading the documentation a different time. Uh, we need to specify Yeah, I guess if we don't specify depot in the environment, then it will be mailed there. You could also set it to IMAPDER, which is a different format. Um, so I, in general, I do want to add these to rc.dscripts, uh, even if the defaults are compiled into the binary uh, to make them explicit, to know that those are things that are available to be overridden. Uh, by default, log type will be multi-log, meaning standard out, standard error. And that is, let's probably keep it that way, because I have some examples of, uh, of how I do that in my other rc.d scripts, and it's easier to just keep it the same. Uh, for post reading, I don't. Yeah, yes by default. Allow plain text logins is yes by default. And the way that you, I have to check my understanding. Uh, maybe you don't set these or you do set these. By default, they're not set. Can't tell. And then you have to specify so why were we able to start up? I wonder if my understanding is outdated here. Because I don't think we set any of these. Depot.
Here we go. Yeah, this is what I'm looking for. So what am I obligated to do with this? It does not say. Maybe I got this by reading the code. Um, what about this non-SSO? Yeah, because it's not in here at all. So depot and log type were described here, and these other three things are not, which makes me think. I don't know. I want this script to be good. And I want everything that is available to be explicit. What about TCP rules? Are we doing anything with those here? Typically for an IMAP server, we wouldn't. A lot of stuff here. Gorsh. Uh, I guess I should just sort of uh, start deleting some of these comments and see where we get to. Let's, uh, what's the trick in Tmux? Toggle the panes. It is. Mm -mm. Swap pane, right. Do I have a binding? Okay. Yeah, it's not what I wanted. No, also not what I wanted. Mm. Okay. Let's just keep moving. I am shooting for, I guess a bunch of things in here. <sighs> I guess I want to split them out. See, this is where end of dir would be handy if I had already switched to it, you know, but I haven't. I feel like I'm going in circles a lot today. Uh... Okay, let's do this. I'm just going to take everything that's a to-do comment and put it at the top and see what jumps out at me with what's left. Doesn't look terrible when you look at it this way. 
Oh yeah, and uh, restore a soft limit. What about what about if we look at S six because I have demon tools here. Uh, what if we look at is there like a limit? Yeah. work better I wonder let's go to the github for this and view the code and the source and I'm looking for a six soft limit. Not exactly here. There we go. The portability problem might not be at this level of the program, but what's this? Resource limit shenanigans. Okay. Unclear to me if this addresses my case, but it's a maybe, and I was considering switching this one over to S six anyway. So maybe, maybe. So the script seems to start. Does it stop? Seems like it. Yep. That's kind of exciting. What about the files that are in this package? The FreeBSD doesn't have this yet. Right. Always helps to look at another packaging. Indeed, they have not. And there's that old run script. Okay, so I can't learn anything from that package. Epic fail guy. Hello. Yes, I am aware. Uh, thank you. No, I did notice it because I, I streamed briefly playing the piano yesterday and forgot to change it back. Uh, I'm going to have to sign off the, the stream pretty soon anyway, so I decided, oops. Thanks for letting me know. If you're looking for music, I'm sorry. Uh, but we're doing some package source today. Appreciate your letting me know. Um... Uh,
What I'm trying to do today is to package up this new version of Bink IMAP and it's just a little messy because it's packaged, um, it's distributed in such a different shape than it used to be. So something we're noticing here about my to-do list. Oh, nice. Yes, I think I'd seen you there before. Uh, yeah, happy to have you back and watching. Uh, the package sorcery is really, really rough today. I feel like I'm, I have a lot of indecision about what to do and what's important and what's enough. So maybe it helps me to talk it out loud a little more. Uh, but I'm trying to catch up to a new upstream. Bink IMAP was taken over uh, by somebody who also has a Qmail fork of long standing. And I want to take his update into package source because I actually might want to try running the new version of Bink IMAP in place of Dovecot and see if it's okay. I do like this design. Um, so I guess the next thing that I could make a jump on is to... I'd really like to not. Uh, I want to change my stuff in package source to S6 all at once instead of doing it piecemeal. And so for now, I think I want to keep the dependency on daemon tools and not do S6 yet. So let's say, again, I'm going to collect my to-do items up here. Switch from daemon tools to S6 later. There's one. And yes, this is here for check password. Um, in the run script, as it stands, you can see here there is there has to be a check password. And by default, I have it be NB check password because I want there to be a default value. And that command path is provided by package alternatives. None of the check password programs in package source install that. They install themselves and package alternatives will figure out according to its rules, which one is this. And that lets this work as a default if we have that dependency. And it's a little, it's a little weird to do that because uh, package alternatives is supposed to be user facing and not something that packages depend on. But I have been doing that and I'm not going to stop until I have to or until I get a better idea. So that's something I can leave for later. What do I have Qmail accept utils here for? What's up? When did I add that? Contents of that are four programs. Auth up check not root. It's for check not root. Okay. Fix SMTP IO. Oh, yeah. So let's see. Do we need it for check not root? Or check not root. Uh, we can take a quick look at the Bing IMAP code and see if it has a check for user ID zero. That might be a way to lose that dependency. So let's pop in. Hmm, quite a few. Woof. Okay, so messages have IDs also. I'm looking for the the C library call to see whether see what the um, the effective or real user ID of the running process. And this looks like it's doing a bunch of other stuff about messages. 
So where does the authentication happen? When we call check password. Yeah, you know what? I think that's going to be it. Uh, this code is probably relying on check password as anything would. And we're going to want check not root. Okay, so I'm going to keep that dependency. Hopefully I remember that for next time. Uh, right, this is a new dependency, oops, by SSL, because we no longer directly link with OpenSSL, which is good. We depend on Anuxpy TLS providing parent process, which is this. And again, same way I want to switch across the board from daemon tools to S6 in my packages, I also want to switch across the board to S6 networking. But I'm not going to do it piecemeal for this particular case. So I think this is just a, a not now. That can be settled. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I map user and group? What is that for? It was there before. The unprivileged user for bank IMAP. Why? It doesn't make sense to me that we have this. I know I saw in these example run scripts. Yeah, in these example run scripts, we were seeing the listening TCP server, SSL server, running uh, as an unprivileged user. So, but why? It doesn't make sense to me. Because the, T the SSL server, mm, it does want to run the TLS engine as a separate user. How do we do it for Keenman? So SSL server can optionally start encryption later and when the application says to start and it can be doing the TLS processing as a privileged separated user. It's going to be one of these flags. So not just a G and a U or this, but where the SSL engine is happening. At least I thought this was the case. I guess these things. SSL user SSL group. Yep, that's where it is. Uh, okay. So to interoperate with that, Uh 
Okay, so this is how we're able to get SSL server in particular. I don't know if this is portable to S6 networking. Uh, to run the SSL engine as a particular user and group, we do this. And I guess we ought to do the same. Mm. And now this is sending me down another possible rabbit hole, which is that there's a fork in the road depending on whether SSL is enabled for the service or not. And the way I did this for Qmail have defined this. It's auto by default. And so typically, if the certificate exists, we enable. Uh, otherwise, we do it explicitly if asked or not asked. Uh, Okay, so enabling TLS looks like jamming some more stuff into the environment before we run SSL server. Specifically, the context in which to run the SSL engine. Uh, the DH params, where the cert is. If there's a separate key and it doesn't exist. Uh, extract it from the cert to a separate file, because I guess something needs both. Yeah, okay. Woof, so this is a lot of cleverness that I did in Qmail SMTPD so that it run without a cert when there isn't one. It would use the cert if there is one, and then you could specify if you wanted it to, I suppose if you want it to die if there isn't one, then you can specify yes. And if you want it to not use a cert even if there is one, then you could specify no. That's a lot of branches for compatibility and least surprise. Um, but that's for the SMTP service. I feel like, what did we do for the POP service? I, it's probably the same. It is. And it's probably the same kind of mess. Yeah, exactly. So I, I might think it's easier to skip this for, um, for the Bink IMAP service, but I think this is exactly what I have to do there too. Um, and this is really, as far as I can tell, Let's pop back over to S6 networking and see if some of these values are the same. Uh, I see it. Okay. Not too far off. Okay, now we're talking. So S6 TLS DIO, which is the program in S6 networking that handles the TLS engine. This is how you instruct it how to run the engine. Uh, the variable names are called this instead of that. What about DH file? Doesn't have it. What about Cert file, yeah, and key file, yeah, and cader may or may not need it, sure. Okay, so it looks like this is really very similar to what it would need to be for S6 networking. 
which makes me feel better about duplicating it into Bing IMAP. Less gross, anyway. So I guess that's the next step. Uh, and I was trying to decide. Um, It still makes sense. What I really want, as far as I can tell, is through SEP TLS engine, which is WID GID. Let's do it like this. Okay, so my hypothesis then is that the this user and group goes away. I don't actually want the SSL server itself running as an unprivileged user because I want it to be able to give up privileges when it calls check password. I guess for yeah, this is it. For system users. We want to run as root so we can drop. For virtual users, maybe we want to run as non root. I don't know. Uh, either way. I think that's my current understanding. Um, I don't use any virtual users stuff personally, but I think that's the use case here. We're talking about the virtual mail manager. We're talking about using the check passwords from those. So in that scenario, right, uh, yes, uh, in one day with S6 TLS DIO TLS UG ID. Yeah, I was looking at S6 networking not because we're using it yet, uh, but because when we do, I want to do something that's hopefully not more trouble to switch to and it looks like it has the same idea with different names and so i can just hopefully figure out an abstraction so that i guess package source users who want to keep using XPy ssl can get these defined for them and package source users who want to use the default s6 networking when that's the default will get these set for them but for now it's hard coded to XPy ssl so let's say this. Yes, good clarification. Yeah. Um, many of the environment variables were exactly the same across Uxpy SSL and S6 networking. These ones are almost, but it'll require a little, a little cleverness in the scripting someday. So this is why we have this user and group. So that in the virtual users case, which I don't personally know well that the tcp server can drop to that user to begin with because the check password isn't going to have to drop further privileges it's going to keep running as that unix user that is not what i'm doing so i guess i don't remove that yet even though my my feeling is that i would want to remove it until it's proven necessary but Maybe I'll just leave it. So I will only have a few more minutes here.
That might be it. What's left in options? Right, what is Pam doing for us? We pick it, yeah. So everywhere in package source that there's a dependency on check password. Uh, I try to have a Pam option because some systems actually can't use the original DJB check password anymore. And in those cases, check password PAM is likely to work. Um, why is INET6 an option for TCP rules? Right. Yeah, I really gotta, I really gotta bite the bullet on this one. I have this problem elsewhere in packages that I maintain that there's this idea of an INET6 option, even though there's no networking code in some of these packages. Um, because that could branch, like if you want it to be really conservative about your QMail, for example, then you would want DJB's IP version 4 only original OOXPY TCP. Uh, and if that's less important to you and you're willing to use somebody's fork that supports version 6 as well, dual stack, then INET6 gets you that as the dependency. But the two packages conflict. Because they install many of the programs with the same names. And then that's not the end of the story, which is what I wrote down here and I'm trying to decide what to do with. Um, the TCP rules file generated by OOXPY TCP 6, I mean, I would assume, uh, is able to have <laughs> rules about IPv6 addresses. Uh, and the original one probably is not. And so if what we're needing, I think it's the case that SSL server depends on specifically the IP version 6 compatible TCP rule. Okay, no. Older versions of OOXPY TCP can be used as well. They just won't have CIDR blocks or version 6. But once you have the CDB, you could use it as well across all the versions. Okay. I don't know. I think the time might be coming to declare... What are my options? I could say everything that has this INET6 option should just unconditionally depend on OOXPY TCP6 from now on because we don't need to be that conservative. Um, or I could try to, uh, try to defer this until I can switch everything to S6 networking. No, I think I could, I think I could bite this bullet sooner. Um, that's another option. I could make it so that both of those OOXPY TCP packages... Oh, this might be a very good idea. And S6 Networking could do it too. Uh, make all of them anything that provides a TCP server and, uh, and a TCP client and whatever other programs, make them install under unique names, and then again rely on package alternatives to put them under the names that people expect. I'm going to consider that very seriously. Uh, how about package alternative support? Or OOXPY tools. 
So eg install spy tcp tcp server as come back to that install uxpy tcp6 tcp server as install s6 networking s6 tcp server as Package alternatives by them to TCP server. I like this thought very much. I also think I have to stop the stream here. But we did, I did not do a lot of coding today, but I did a lot of organizing what's there and figuring out what to do. So we have much less crap here. We have a run script that almost works. Uh, I need some more variables defined. I decided that I'm not gonna delete this user and group yet. And that I do want this in my script. Borrow from g email pop three d dot sh, and that's how the TLS will get configured. Okay, so there's there's work left to do in the rc dot script. I'm just gonna leave this. Uh, and then, not exactly orthogonal to this, but maybe to clear space for this update, I could go everywhere that has a NukeSpy TCP dependency and make it a NukeSpy TCP 6 dependency. And that might simplify life with this tool set. Uh, or what I was saying here. Like actually make these all alternatives in some way, which will be a little annoying, but I'll have to think that through. That might be the best choice. Let them all be installed simultaneously. Figure out what good unique names for them would be. That's part of the challenge. and then just leave that at the end. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up today's stream. We are closer to committing this update to Vink IMAP, which I am tentatively excited to try uh, now that it has a new upstream and has had the networking and SSL code ripped out of it, which I very much appreciate. And we thought a little bit about a near future in which uh, I'm not using Uxpy SSL and Uxpy TCP6, but I'm using S6 networking instead for all the package source stuff that I'm managing. Uh, we're not doing that yet, but we're imagining someday that we're doing that. And uh, yeah, that's today's stream. A little bit shorter than usual and a little bit more confused than usual because there are a lot of things to think about. But hopefully by next time, I can have this package going would be cool. It's nice to have alternatives to popular software. And again, Bink IMAP uh, always interested me. It's just by the time I was in position to try it, it had been abandoned for a long time and Dovecot was really good. Dovecot is really good. I'm just interested to try this too. So that's it for today's stream. Thanks for watching um, and we will see you next time.